Okay, guys, we are going to talk about cardiac pacing and vascular disease. So this is for the New Brunswick Critical Care Nursing Program. My name is Sue Morris. I'm a clinical nurse educator at the New Brunswick Heart Center, and this is for my provincial critical care students. So I will go through um, and just start with the cardiac pacing. So when we think about cardiac pacing, that could be a whole 12 or 15 hour lecture. Um, pacemakers are very complex devices now. So what we're gonna focus on is uh, the part that we would see in critical care. So basically the temporary pacemakers, whether it be transvenous, epicardial, transcutaneous, we're gonna talk just a little bit about their use within the um, intensive care unit. So there's essentially two things that a pacemaker does. It paces, also referred to as trigger, and this uses milliamps to cause a capture. And I was thinking of the little memory trick, the word smack in the middle of the word smack is M-A. A pacemaker also senses, or the majority of them do. And um, I was described sensing as the ability of the device to see any intrinsic activity that is happening. And we usually use millivolts. So instead of calling it millivolts, I often use a little memory trick, millivision. So I think I have somewhere in this presentation where you basically have to see before you step on the gas. And that's the same with pacemakers. You wanna be able to see what's happening in the heart before you stimulate the heart because you don't wanna stimulate A on a T wave, but you also don't wanna pace somebody unnecessarily. Um, most patients will do better in their own intrinsic rhythm and uh, we prefer that they be in their own rhythm. So we like demand pacing. So in every pacemaker, there will be a number of letters. So for temporary pacing, there will be three letters. So the first letter, so maybe you have a VVI pacemaker, maybe you have a DDD pacemaker, maybe you have an AAI. What those letters mean is the first letter is the chamber paced. The second letter is the chamber sensed. And then the third letter is the response that the pacemaker will give in relation to what it has seen. So the majority of you will deal with transvenous or transcutaneous pacemakers in critical care. And those will be VVI pacemakers. They will pace the ventricle, sense the ventricle, meaning what they're looking for are QRSs. So that is what the device is looking to sense. And then that I stands for inhibition. And so basically what that means is, is if we set a pacemaker at a rate of 60, we have told the device, you only have to work when the patient's heart rate is 60 or below. And let's say the patient's heart rate is 61 or 62. The device will inhibit or not stimulate the heart but it still senses that intrinsic beat and it sets up its timer or its sensor. All pacemakers work on timers. So let's say a patient had a pacemaker set at a rate of 60. And let's say the patient had no 
underlying rhythm. Then the device would fire every second because there's 60 seconds in a minute. But pacemakers like to deal or like to think in milliseconds. So that would be 1,000 milliseconds between each paced beat. We call that a pacing interval. But let's say the patient had a spontaneous or an intrinsic beat. The pacemaker also senses that. And if the device were set at a rate of 60, it would sense the intrinsic QRS and then it would start its timer. At the end of a thousand milliseconds, if there were no sensed QRSs, then the device would trigger the heart and cause a contraction. And the timer starts all over again. So it starts, we've had a pace beat, and now it's looking for the next 1000 milliseconds to see if there's any intrinsic activity. If there is none at the end of 1000 milliseconds, because again, this pacemaker is set at a rate of 60, then the timer will time out and the ventricle will be stimulated again. Now, when we think about permanent pacemakers, we could have four letters or five letters, but that will be for a uh, discussion for another time. When we think about temporary pacemakers, the majority of you in our province of New Brunswick will deal with VVI pacemakers. The only group of people who will deal with temporary DDD pace, um, pacemakers are the staff of the surgical intensive care unit and the post-op cardiac surgery floor at the New Brunswick Heart Center because we have wires, temporary wires sewn on to the patient's epicardium. And these can be atrial wires and ventricular wires. So that wouldn't allow us to do dual chamber pacing. Patients do better with dual chamber patient pacing, especially if they have low ejection fractions because you get that nice synchrony, the atria contracts, then the ventricle, atria, ventricle. So you don't lose your atrial kick in DDD pacing, but you do lose your atrial kick in VVI pacing. So when we look at, we can have an A standing for atrium, V standing for ventricle, D standing for dual. And again, the most common settings that you will see is a VBI pacemaker. Periodically, the staff of the ICU in the Heart Center and 5B North will see AAI and DDD. So post-op cardiac surgery patients, as I said, will have temporary pacing wires. They always have ventricular wires. But oftentimes the surgeon will suture in atrial wires if they have a poor left ventricular function because they do lose that atrial kick when we only VVI pace a patient. So these are the devices that we use in the New Brunswick Heart Center. These, this one right here is the one that you would see if you were working in Fredericton or Moncton. Um, it's a lovely device. It has your rate, so it defaults to 80 when you turn it on. This is the smack or the milliamps. And then the bottom is the vision or the millivolts. This one, <laughs> this device we're going to not talk very much about because the only place that you will see it is at the New Brunswick Heart Center. So, We'll, uh, we'll skip over that one. And so there's different types of leads that we can do transvenous pacing with. We can use one of these leads here. Often they'll call them a stiff wire. 
And then we can also use this one. And it is referred to as a floating balloon pacemaker. So this one here has to be inserted under fluoroscopy. This one here can be inserted at the bedside so you can use it in an ICU, in the ER. And to be honest, uh, we have started using these at the New Brunswick Heart Center um, basically because we've had a couple of cardiac tamponades related to how stiff these um, transvenous wires are. So our physicians have started to embrace and love the uh, floating balloon pacemaker. I don't find that they sense as well, but that's only a personal um, preference. So you will see uh, the majority of patients will have the floating device. And so this is a good little video that you can watch at another point in time for um, insertion of a temporary pacemaker. I will send you the link in the notes. So pacemaker sensing. Um, when, when you want a pacemaker to inhibit, also known as do nothing, then your patient's heart rate will have to be faster than what the device is set at. And so whenever you have a lead in the atrium, the atrial lead will be looking for P waves. When you have a lead in the ventricle, then it would be looking for QRSs. So depends on where the device is placed, so which chamber depends on what it is sensing. So sensing is a, a little bit um, backwards to the way we think. If you think of the highest numeric value, and so the device that we have has a sensing of 20 millivolts. And you can see by this example down here that QRSs can be different heights. So keep that in mind when we go to the next page here. So I like to think of sensing as a fence. And oftentimes I'll use kind of the foolish analogy that there are some cute boys living next door or girls, whatever your preference is. And when the fence is 20 millivolts high, I can't check any of them out. I can't look at them. And so maybe creepily every night I go out and I start to lower the fence a little bit. So let's say we're at 20 millivolts here. And then tonight I go out and I lower it to 19, 18, 17, until I can see consistently see my QRSs. And so let's say that it sensed at 14 millivolts. I am fearful that there might be one QRS that's not quite tall enough to be sensed. So oftentimes when we discuss the a sensing threshold, we will look at where it's sensed, and then we will cut that numeric value in half, meaning we double the sensitivity. So the lower you go, the more sensitive you are. And so people will often say to me, well, why wouldn't you just set it at its most sensitive, and then it would see everything? Well, I don't want it to see everything. I want to see QRSs. I do not want it to see T waves. So sometimes devices will have to be set at the lowest numeric value, which is the most sensitive. But every patient will have a different sensing threshold that's based on the condition of their myocardium. 
how hydrated the cell is, what their electrolytes are. And so your pacing and sensing threshold can actually change based on your fluid status, based on your electrolyte count. And so we often will set it at half of the numeric value, which makes it twice as sensitive. So I always think of sensitivity, the lower you go, the more sensitive you are. And so each patient will have a unique sensing threshold. So once you have assessed that the uh, device can see okay, now you want to stimulate the heart. And so we use the milliampage to cause a contraction. So the higher the milliamp numeric value, the more smack that you will give the heart. And I kind of like the analogy of aim before you shoot. And so when you aim, you have to see what you're doing. So you assess your millivision, also known as millivolts, before you smack the heart with milliamps. So here is a picture down here. Whenever I see a rhythm strip that has pacing spikes not followed by a wide QRS, the very first thing I have to do is look and see if the device is sensing appropriately. So what I have done is I've seen what my pacing interval is. My pacing interval is defined as the distance between two paced beats, so here and here, so the distance right in here, but it's also defined as the distance from a sensed beat, so here is an intrinsic beat. So if I measure the distance from here to here, it is the same as the distance between these two pace beats. So I think this device is sensing appropriately. The distance from here to here is a pacing interval. Here to here is a pacing interval. But then again, you have to think of the sense beat. And so this device is sensing perfectly. It just isn't capturing. And somebody, for some reason, not sure why, um, has dropped the smack or the milliamp that this patient is receiving. So he has what's called loss of capture. But the first thing I had to do is make sure it was sensing appropriately. And I find the easiest way to do that is to take a white piece of paper and mark the distance between two pacing spikes. So this area right here is my pacing interval. I could figure it out mathematically, but I don't enjoy doing that. So I'm gonna use a piece of white paper, make two lines between two pace beats, and then I am gonna walk that across my page. I can see that it's coming in here nicely. Oh, here is a spike. It came in at the right time, it just didn't capture. This spike came in at the right time, it didn't capture. And then our body said, oh my, there is no cardiac output. So our ventricle threw out what we call a ventricular escape beat. So this is not a PVC because it didn't come in early. It's a ventricular escape beat. And it's basically the ventricle's way of saying, oh my, I need to throw out some cardiac output here. But the pacemaker sensed it. And so he reset himself. And if you measure the distance from the tip of this QRS 
to the next pacing spike, your white sheet of paper with your two marks on it will line up perfectly. That tells you the device is sensing appropriately. It's just not capturing. When I troubleshoot that and I say it's not capturing, I need more smack to the heart. So I increase the numeric value of my milliamps. And I usually go up by one milliamp at a time until I see nice, consistent capture. Occasionally, devices will need to be repositioned by the cardiologist or the uh, electrophysiologist um, because maybe they're in contact with myocardium that is infarcting or has infarcted, or maybe the position of the device has just, it's come out of position. Um, and so that is a physician scope of practice and not a nursing scope of practice. So We've just discussed this, so we'll go to the next slide. So here again is a definition of a pacing interval. It's a distance between two pace beats or the distance between a sensed intrinsic beat and a pace beat. And we measure it in milliseconds. And so I like to use the example of a pacemaker set at a rate of 60, because that's easy, I can do the math for that. So it would be one second between each beat. If we convert that into pacemaker language, it's milliseconds and that converts to a thousand milliseconds. So here's an example of a pacing interval distance between two pace beats, but also the distance between this sensed beat and the next paced interval. So the distance between two pace beats or a sensed beat and the next paced beat. So here is a pacemaker. First thing I do is say, is it sensing appropriately? So I'm gonna take a sheet of paper, and I'm gonna see two pacing beats that happen together. So here's one and here's one. And I mark those on a piece of paper. And I see that mm, this one came in, but did it see this QRF? No. Did it see this QRS? No. So it is not sensing appropriately. So how would I fix this? I would lower my threshold or lower the numeric value. So let's say I was set at 10 millivolts. I would turn to nine millivolts. I would see if I got proper sensing. That didn't happen at nine, I would go to eight and seven and six and so on. So I lower so that I can see more and I can sense more. So when I look at this, I see pacing spikes that are not followed by any QRS. So the first thing I have to do is see if it came in or sensed appropriately. So I'm gonna take my white sheet of paper, I'm gonna mark this spike and this spike, and I can see that this one came in at the right time, this one came in at the right time, this one did too, and it actually caused a contraction. So I know that my device is sensing appropriately. So I am going to increase my milliamps until I see consistent capture for this patient. So this is a problem with not enough milliamps. Here is a patient who has AAI pacing. And the reason I know that is because there is a spike in front of each P wave. So this is AAI pacing. 
when I look at this, this is VBI pacing and the underlying rhythm is atrial fibrillation. I can see that coarse um, isoelectric line, so uh, descriptive of atrial fibrillation. So here are some random thoughts and questions. With VBI pacing, what part of the cardiac cycle is missing? Atrial kick. Why do patients, patients with atrial fib only receive VBI permanent pacemakers and not ones that would pace the atrium? Atrium does not like to be paced when it's an atrial fib. So it's actually just a very expensive device that the patient will not um, benefit from. What are some of the indications for AAI pacing? Well, I often think of um, sinus brad and junctional rhythm, but whenever you do AAI pacing, always make sure that your patient has an intact AV node because you're stimulating the atrium to cause a contraction. It still needs to go down through the AV node, the bundle of hiss and bundle branches to cause a, a ventricular contraction. So you have to have intact AV node in order to do AAI pacing. And so that answers the bottom question is in third degree heart block, you do not have an intact AV node. So you can stimulate the atrium, but it will not get conducted to the ventricle. So here's a patient, Stella, Stella Stellar, comes to the ICU with a diagnosis of urosepsis. She's confused, hemodynamically unstable, and she has a permanent DDD pacemaker set at a rate of 72. When you place her on the monitor, this is her rhythm and her heart rate is 126. So the question asks, how is this possible when the pacemaker is only set at a rate of 72? Well, if you look, there is a P in front of every spike, uh, in front of every ventricular paced beat. This is called atrial tracking, and it can only happen in a DDD pacemaker. So the atrial pacemaker wire is sensing intrinsic P waves. And when that P wave is sensed, the atrial output or the um, device is inhibited in the atrium. But every DDD pacemaker has what you and I would call a PR interval in the device. They actually call it an AV delay. And so it's the period of time that the pacemaker is going to wait and see if that P wave gets conducted to the ventricle. If the P wave does not get conducted to the ventricle, there is communication between the atrial wire and the ventricular wire. And the device says, hey, that P wave did not get conducted Mr. Ventricular Wire, you need to stimulate the ventricle and cause a contraction. So this is called atrial tracking. And this is because this patient is, is dry. And so she still has an intact SA node. And so if she had an intact AV node, she would be in sinus tachycardia but she does not. So the P wave is determining what the heart rate is, and that is 126. So I bet you if you treat this lady with some volume and get her antibiotics into her, her heart rate or her sinus node will slow down and she won't have that high sympathetic drive. We don't really like when patients pace at a faster rate like this, because you can develop what's um, called pacemaker-mediated tachycardia. 
doesn't happen very often, um, but it can when the SA node is going at a fast rate and you have a DDD pacemaker in place. So that, uh, that was kind of a tough question, but it does happen periodically and people get confused about it. So this is just an explanation and how do we manage or get her SA node to stop firing so rapidly? We manage the problem, just like when we talked about managing the um, problem of sinus tachycardia. This is the exact same thing. We manage her dehydration and we get her antibiotics into her and she will do much better. So here's a patient, Mr. Jimbini comes to your CCU and this is his rhythm. So immediately I see more P's than QRS's. So I say I have some type of a heart block. I also look and see that I have a nice regular atrial rhythm, which always happens with heart blocks of any type, but I have an irregular ventricular response. So immediately I know it's not first degree heart block or third degree heart block. So now I have second degree type one and second degree type two. And we know that with second degree, it's always, always a good idea to check a number of PR intervals. And if I check this PR interval, I see that it is constant all the way across the page. So I have a second degree heart block type two. So what kind of pacemaker is going to be inserted? Well, that's kind of an easy question because the only types of pacemakers that we insert are VVI pacemakers. So we're going to pace this patient's ventricle to give them adequate cardiac output. So it could be at a rate of 60, or it could be at a rate of 70 or 80. So we put the device in and he comes back to your unit after insertion. The alarm is ringing on the monitor and this is what you see on the screen. So you say to yourself, okay, I need to go in and check this patient. So I go in, I do my 30 second assessment, make sure that I instill confidence and say, Jim, uh, my name is Sue, I'm just here, I'm gonna hang out with you and I'm just gonna check your pacemaker. So when you look and you do a quick little assessment, you see that the pacemaker spikes came in at the right time. So it is sensing appropriately, it just needs more smack. So. If we look at this device here, so this, some of our facilities in, um, in New Brunswick have this device. I would look at my middle button, my milliamps, and I would give him more smack. So if it was set at six, I would turn it to seven. If it still didn't fully capture, then it would go up by one until I got consistent capture. And that brings us to the end of cardiac pacing.